Welcome to numerical methods. So next section is floating point numbers. Floating point numbers is now a bit more interesting. And floating point numbers are the objects yeah, which uh, we are working with. So we will discuss the IEEE 754 standard. So this sounds like a very special thing, but actually it's used in many programming languages, Java, C++, or frameworks like MATLAB, uh, R, and so on, with small deviation yeah, in, some, in some details. So the computer represents a certain subset of the real numbers called floating point numbers. And this set is encoded by three integers. There is the integer S, which will encode the sign plus or minus. There is the integer C and the integer E. Yeah, the E encodes an exponent. So these integers have certain ranges. For the sign, I just need a plus or minus. I need a zero or one. I just need one bit. And then it's you know, maybe a matter of choice. For the C, we choose C between zero and two to the power of Q. Zero included, two to the power of Q not included. So I have two to the power of Q different values for C. So that requires Q bits. And then for the E, there is a lower bound E min minus one and an upper bound E min plus one. I will comment on the strange choice why we have E min minus one, so one additional value on the left, and E max plus one, one additional value on the right uh, in the next uh, uh, slide. But uh, how many bits do we need for this? So um, I have E max minus E min values. If I would be in the interval from E min to E max, plus one, because there's also the zero. But then I have the two additional values at the end point. And if this is equal to some two to the power of R, I need, of course, R bits. So I have one plus Q plus R bits. So usually I can use now 32 bits to encode the number or 64 bit to encode the number 32 would be single precision floating point, 64 double precision floating point. How we choose, yeah, how many bits we choose or the standard chooses, that's a matter of choice. There, I have a small, a small table, but it's maybe not important now for the definition of the floating point numbers. Yeah, what do we do now with these three integers, yeah, the three integers, S, C, and E. So the set of floating point numbers contains the so-called normalized floating point numbers, maybe the important part here. And this representation is active if the E is between, between E min and E max. Yeah? So this special value E min minus one is actually not active here. So E is not equal to E min minus one. And the special value E max plus one, so the other one, uh, is not active here. If I have a value E in this range, then the normalized base two floating point number X, this one is now defined by Okay, let's, the, let's have the constant uh, be given. Uh, P is um, a positive integer. E min and E max are integers that could have a sign. Yeah? So the exponent could become negative if we like. I define a Q that is P minus one. Actually a small comment, yeah, in earlier versions I often used just the letter P, but P in the literature is often the um, 
precision. And the exponent that occurs here is two to the power of Q. So to avoid that, I always have to write P minus one. Yeah? I use the letter Q to actually ease a little bit the notation. So my normalized base two floating point number is given by minus one to the power of S. Okay, this encodes the sign. Yeah, So MI on the left side or MI on the right side here. And then I have a one plus C divided by two to the power of Q. Recall that C is in between zero included, two to the power of Q not included. So I know that this guy here is between zero included, one not included. Yeah, And from that, you also know that this part here is between one and two, one included, two not included. And then this, this number, yeah, one point something, is multiplied with a two to the power of e. Yeah, there is your exponent here. So the e is between e min and e max. Consider the case where c is equal to uh, zero. Yeah? So I have here the case c is equal to zero. Yeah, then actually these are just the powers of two. Yeah? Two to the power of e min, two to the power of e min plus one, two to the power of e min plus two, and so on. In between this interval, I have an equidistant partitioning of this interval. Now, every step goes one divided by two to the power of q. So you have actually c equals zero, and then you have c equals one, two, three. So you see, this is here the case where q is equal to two. Two to the power of two is four. So I have four different values for c, zero, one, two, three. Yeah? And then the partitioning starts again, yeah? zero, one, two, three. Yeah? This is a representation of my numbers. And one little remark, there is a gap here. Yeah. So zero is not in this set. So actually we we cannot represent uh, something that has a zero. Actually, if you forget about uh, this exponent two to the power of e, then the stuff that is in front always starts with a one. Yeah, It's a one and then a one divided by uh, a C divided by two, yeah, so maybe a zero, uh, one, zero, okay, something like that. Yeah? It always starts with, with, with a one. So if you count actually digits, uh, how many digits do we have? It's one, two, three, four, and there's a fifth digit, but this fifth digit here is always uh, one. So this is Q is equal to four, but P would be equal to five. I have five digits, yeah, but this guy is sometimes called um, implicit. So this is multiplied with maybe two to the power of E. I cannot represent zero. So let's summarize a little bit the things here. This was already on the slide, yeah, this part here, the part with the C, is an equipartitioning of the interval yeah, from 2 to the power of E to 2 to the power of E plus 1. Yeah, maybe also note this. What's happening if C is actually the last possible number you can represent? The last possible number you can represent is 2 to the power of Q minus 1. So two to the power of Q minus one is the last number you can represent. If you then add one, you get a two to the power of Q. This means that this ratio here becomes one. This means that this guy becomes two. This means that it's the same if C switches back to zero and the exponent increases by one. 
Yeah. So adding a one to the C always gives you the next floating point number. Also for the case where C is hitting here, here the bound, because then you can reset the C to zero and increase the exponent. So in other words, the distance here from there to there is also one divided by two to the power of Q times two to the power of E. So I have an equidistant partitioning of this um, interval. You can also have a look at the smallest and largest number. Okay, so you get this if you plug in Z equal zero, the smallest positive and the largest negative number. So this is here and here. Yeah? And in between, there is a gap. So these guys are minus 2 to the power of e min and plus 2 to the power of e min. A thing that is worth to note is that if you have two neighboring normalized floating point numbers that have the same sign, then they have approximately the same relative distance. Okay, so I already made this um, remark. So consider the case where the exponent here is the same. If you start with a number x1 that has a c divided by 2 to the power of q, and then you go to um, another number, say x2, and this one has just a c plus 1 divided by 2 to the power of q. Yeah? So if you then take the difference of the two, so I take the difference of x2 minus x1, but I will divide by x1. Okay, what you get is that actually this one in front, this cancels and this c also cancels and I just get the one divided by two to the power of q multiplied with the exponent on the top, but then I divide by x1, divided by x1 will cancel the exponent, 2 to the power of e. So I know that this here is between 1 and 2, 1 included, 2 not included. So I know that this relative distance is between, the worst case is if I divide by 1, and the best case is if I divide by 1 plus C, 2 to the power of Q minus 1 divided by 2 to the power of Q. So I get that this is between 1 divided by 2 to the power of Q plus 1, not included, and 1 divided by 2 to the power of Q. So good thing my relative distance is bounded yeah? by 1 divided by 2 to the power of Q. This will be relevant later. It gives us a bound on the relative error. So back to the definition. We have the defect that zero is not included. I cannot represent zero. So I need to fix this problem. Uh, and the computer can represent a smaller set of other numbers, and these numbers are called the denormalized numbers, and this set also contains now the zero. This representation is now active if E is equal to E min minus one. You know? So we have the special value yeah, on the left side for my exponent E min. Uh, e is equal to E min minus one. The computer will skip to a different representation for the floating point number x. So a denormalized floating point number is given by x in R, yeah, which is now given. So the constant are the same as before. Yeah? The p, the e min, my q is the same. So I have a minus 1 to the power of s encoding the sign. And then this 1 plus term changes to a c divided by 2 to the power of q multiplied with 2 to the power of e min. 
So you see, it's just the equipartitioning of this gap. Yeah. So with the corresponding step size. So my step size is one divided by two to the power of Q. Yeah. So my C is between zero included, two to the power of Q not included. Strange thing, actually, I have two different zeros here. You see, there are two different zeros. There's a plus zero and a minus zero. And uh, these two guys here, the minus two to the power of e min and the plus two to the power of e min. Uh, okay, these numbers were the endpoint in the normalized floating point numbers that we have already defined. Yeah, So these guys are in the other set. Now we are just filling the gap. Yeah? So we have C equals zero, one, two, three. Yeah? Or also for the negative side, C equals zero, one, two, three. So this is just an equipartitioning of our interval. And they include now the zero. They have the same absolute distance. Yeah, speaking of the distance, uh, there is um, a thing that is relevant. Okay, this is now the set of numbers we have defined, yeah, the normalized, the denormalized ones. And you could ask yourself, um, actually, having some number, say this guy here, what is the distance to the next floating point number. So if this here is x, yeah, what is then the distance to the next floating point number? And this distance has a name. This is the unit in the last place. Yeah? And this depends on where you are looking at. Yeah? For example, here, it is a little bit wider. Yeah? If you take a look at, for example, zero, Okay, then it is a little bit smaller. So the unit in the last place is somehow the absolute difference of two neighboring floating point numbers. This absolute distance is increasing, so it depends on which number you are looking at. We had for the normalized floating point numbers, so the guys that are on this side here, yeah, so this these guys, we have that the relative distance stays bounded, but actually relative distance doesn't make sense if you get close to zero. Yeah? Relative error, yeah? what is the relative error between 1.2 and zero? Yeah? That's infinity, hmm? because you if you divide by zero, that's infinity. So a relative error does not make sense here in, the, in, in this region. I'm interested in the absolute error, the absolute distance is the unit in the last place. So this guy has a name, the ULP. Yeah, and it is just what we get if we increase the C by one. So we made this exercise. If we increase the C by one, actually we get a one divided by two to the power of Q yeah, as an additional value, but of course multiplied with the exponent on which we are. And here you see the two exponent, the E if we are in the normalized set and the E min if we are in the denormalized set. This is the so-called uh, unit in the last place. And yeah, maybe I can also ask the computer um, how this guy looks like. So let's create a new experiment here. Okay, let's create a main method. Yeah, and um, you can ask, for example, the ULP at one, yeah? So there is a function here that gives you this. ULP of one, maybe I print this. Okay, this is the ULP of one. Maybe we also ask the ULP unit in the last place of zero. 
So let's run our new little experiment. And you see, okay, this is a two times 10 to the minus 16. This is a five times 10 to the minus 324. Yeah? So actually this here is a very small thing. Yeah. So I'm already here in the region where things are very, very small, yeah? very small units. But if you are at the region where you have a one, yeah, so this is maybe here the region where you have a one, okay, then it's already a 10 to the minus 16. The problem related to my teaser was that I was very close to the 10 to the minus 16 thing and the derivative was close to one. So I was actually very close to these regions here. Yeah. Actually, the quantity that is uh, often of interest is the half of the ULP. Yeah? And why is that? Okay, consider you have an interval where these two guys here are floating point numbers. And then you have some result of a calculation that lies outside the set. And of course, your mapping is take the closest floating point number to represent the result. Yeah? So think back of integer arithmetic. We have a similar problem. How do we map back? So of course, the mapping is that we take the closest, so the distance that we are interested in is, is one half ULP unit in the last place. Yeah. So if the unit changes the, the C, so one half ULP. So this is one half times one divided by two to the power of Q. So it's two to the power of minus Q plus one multiplied with the exponent, yeah, with the scale on which we are. And you see that this error is my two to the power of minus P. Yeah? My Q was P minus one. And I mentioned that the P in the literature is often used for precision. So this P here is the precision. Actually, it's the number of digits that are represented. But one digit does not occur in my representation because it is actually this digit here, the one which is implicit in this representation. So I have Q additional digits yeah, plus this one would be Q plus one or the zero plus yeah, that is standing here, which is an additional digit. Yeah. So if you combine the two sets, you see that how many digits do you have? You have Q plus one digits. But often in my formulas, the Q is the more relevant exponent. So one half uh, unit in the last place is the two to the minus P. Yeah? And the P is then sometimes called uh, precision. If you divide by the scale, yeah, by the exponent factor, if I divide by the factor, so if you go to the relative distance, then the vector two to the minus P, this is sometimes called machine precision <clears throat> or machine epsilon. So now comes the third set. Because we had E between E min and E max, we had E equals E min minus one. And we also have the possibility that E is equal to E max plus one. So if E is equal to E max plus one, we represent another set of numbers. And these are some useful special values. For example, minus infinity and plus infinity. So plus infinity is just C equals zero and E equals E max plus one. And recall, if you increase the C from the E max by one unit, when you are already at the last possible value, the C equals two to the power of P minus one, then it is like multiplying the E with a factor of two. 
So this value here of infinity is just the next number that would occur if my exponent range in the normalized floating point number would be one digit larger, yeah? one position larger, one number larger. So really, you can interpret this infinity as a number. And this will be relevant if we consider what happens with rounding. Actually, there will something be something strange like rounding to infinity. And once you have rounded to infinity, you don't get out of this. Yeah? It's like a black hole. Yeah? It sucks the arithmetic operation. It sucks it up. And you, you um, land in infinity. There's also another value, yeah, if E equals E max plus one and C is not equal to zero, then this is indicating an error. This is uh, the so-called not, not, not a number. For example, square root of a negative number or zero divided by zero or something like that results in it not a number. So the minus infinity and plus infinity, as I uh, mentioned, can be interpreted as uh, numbers. Uh, so the minus infinity is actually the number that you get out of this representation if you plug in the corresponding values for S being one, yeah, c equals zero and e is e max plus one. So the minus infinity corresponds to minus two e max plus one and the plus infinity corresponds to two to the power of e max plus one. So just plug in the values and you see that this is the corresponding value. And these values are later important if we consider rounding. Okay, so this is my summary. So these are now the numbers that we can represent. Yeah? So you see the normalized floating point numbers, hmm, the one plus C part is between one and two multiplied with the exponent or the denormalized ones, you know, the thing that is between zero and one multiplied with the corresponding scale exponent. Everything has a sign and we have also special values for infinity and, uh, and not a number. Th these are the usually values yeah, for Q and uh, R, depending on 32 or 64 uh, bit. Yeah? So 64 bit double precision, 11 bit exponent. Yeah? So exponent goes from minus 1023 to 1024. And the size of the mantissa, so my Q is um, a 52. So I have a two to the power of 52. So my step is one uh, divided by two to the power of 52. Let's try if this is actually the corresponding ULP. Huh? So what do I get if I print two to the power of minus 52? Two to the power of minus 52 is, yeah, it's exactly this value. Yeah? So you see that my double precision floating point number, they use the Q equals to 52. Yeah? So one step to the next number from the one is uh, one divided by two to the power of 52. Actually, I could have created these numbers also in different ways. And I would like to conclude with uh, this. Let me be a little bit quicker and we will continue uh, on this part in the next session. So I just copy now the code from the example that you also could download. So there is here my floating point number experiment with the ULP, but it's a bit, little bit better commented. Yeah. So 
let's uh, first try this one. Okay, so I have prepared here a little bit code. So what am I doing here? So I start by initializing my floating point number to one. And then while my floating point number divided by two is larger than zero, and my floating point number divided by two is smaller than the previous one, I make it smaller by dividing it by two. Actually, as a mathematician, you would expect that this loop runs forever. It becomes smaller and smaller. But in the computer, there's a certain limit. At a certain point, he cannot make it smaller. Either it will become zero, uh, so it will not be a non-zero positive number, or it will stay at the same value. But he cannot make it smaller. There's nothing in between. Let's have a look what this number here, the tiny, is. And you see that this tiny number that I get, so indeed, if you let this run, this loop, is exactly this ULP of zero. So the last number that he can distinguish before he either rounds to zero or he rounds to the same number again, yeah, this is the um, ULP of zero. So this is this 4.9 times 10 to the minus 324. I could do actually the same experiment by making a small other check. So this here is my small other check. And then we, then we stop. So let's do the same experiment now with another case. Okay, so what do I do here? I initialize epsilon to one, and then I check is one plus epsilon larger than one, or is one plus epsilon smaller than one plus two epsilon? If that is the case, then divide epsilon by two, make epsilon smaller. Actually, as a mathematician, you would expect this loop runs forever. Yeah? Epsilon becomes always smaller, and one plus epsilon should always be larger than one, but one plus two epsilon should also be always larger than one plus one epsilon. However, the computer will stop at a certain point. And what is the point at which he stops? Let's let this run. And you see the epsilon where he stops is our half ULP of one. So this is actually a number where one plus epsilon is equal to one. So one plus epsilon equal to one is true. So if you go back, you have the situation that, say for example, this here is your one and your epsilon is now a number such that one plus epsilon would be here. Huh? So epsilon is maybe something small huh? coming, coming from here. Maybe that's your epsilon. He can represent the epsilon but he cannot add the epsilon to the one. Okay, you see, this is your epsilon, but one plus epsilon does not have a representation. So he has to make a choice. Huh? Either one plus epsilon stays one plus epsilon, or one plus epsilon is equal to one. So what he is doing, one plus epsilon is equal to one, adding the epsilon to the one, gives the same number. And now have a look, this number epsilon where this happens is not so small. Yeah? Okay, it's a 10 to the minus 16, yeah? but it's not a 10 to the minus 300 something. Yeah, I can repre represent very, very small numbers, but already at these numbers, this problem happens. And this is why we have to study now in the next session, floating point arithmetic. So you find here the exercise, the exercise that we uh, did, yeah, print this small value, create the tiny value, print it, and um, maybe a nice last experiment uh, 
try this maybe at home. If you divide tiny by zero by two, actually this will be rounded to zero. If you multiply ze uh, this zero with two, it will stay zero. If you multiply tiny with two, it will be rounded to two tiny. If you divide it by two, then it uh, will be going back to tiny. So you see A and B have different results. So this shows you that floating point arithmetic is not commutative. So you have to be very careful when you write down formulas to understand what's going on. So I have this also here in the code. This was our tiny. Okay. Tiny divided by two is actually has no other representation, is rounded to zero, is, is the zero. If you then multiply this by two again, you get the zero. But if you reverse the operation, tiny multiplied with two, divided by two, you get the correct result. All this code here at our repository. Oops. In this class, yeah, maybe play a little bit with this, with this and that was it for today. Thanks.